All right, so today uh, we are going to discuss the terms of the contract. So um, I will start our today's lecture from an example and um, just to give you an idea as to where we are in the in this course. So um, take an example, think of the contract, uh, a contract as a, as, as a pizza. Okay, I know it's a weird example, but it it will help, believe me. Um, so think of it as a, as a pizza. So you need all essential ingredients to make a pizza, right? So there are those essential ingredients in every pizza. Those are flour, you know, yeast or cheese or some sauce. So these these some uh, these essential ingredients are <clears throat> in all sorts of pizza. So once you know that you have baked the pizza then you can um, look deeper into it and see what kind of a pizza is it. What does it have? Does it have chicken? Does it have pepperoni? Or is it only a veggie pizza? So same way, your, a contract that you have, um, all the contracts have some essential elements or essential ingredients. So what are those essential ingredients? Those essential elements. Those essential elements were covered in our previous nine lectures, and I would have you I would have you write those elements here on the whiteboard. So click on the T for text on the left hand corner and write down all the essential elements of a contract that you can think of that we covered in our previous lectures. Okay, I'll write down the first one. Good, must have offer and acceptance, offer. Offer, acceptance, consideration, certainty, agreement. Okay, agreement. So agreement and offer and acceptance to me are the, are the same things. It's the same element, different name for the same element. But excellent, yes, we do need offer, acceptance, which, which is an agreement, and consideration, certainty, what else? Capacity, excellent. Capacity, consideration. Mm -hmm. One more, there is one more that is missing from this whiteboard. Intent to create legal relation, yes. Excellent. So these are the essential elements that every contract must have, right? Okay. <clears throat> and so these these were the essential elements that we covered in our previous lectures. And now we are going to look deeper into a contract to see uh, what are the terms of the contract and what are their limitations. So in this lecture, we are just going to discuss the terms of the contract, and in the next lecture, we are going to discuss their limitations. And um, okay, so why do we need to look at the terms of the contract? We need to find out what are the terms of the contract to see what the parties to the contract are obliged to do or not to do. Okay, so if you ask yourself, why is it important to establish the term of any contract? What would be the answer? Why, why is it important to establish the terms of a contract? It is important because the question of whether or not um, 
the contract has been breached depends upon whether one party has failed to perform according to the terms of the contract right so and in addition to that the rights that an injured party has following the breach of a contract by another party depends upon whether the term breached was a major term or a minor term so basically whenever there is an issue raised um it has to be established first whether one of the parties has breached one of the terms of a contract so that's why looking um looking deeper into a contract is essential okay so <clears throat> so there are um basically the terms of the contract that we just discussed it it gives substance to the party's obligation and the the terms of the contract they lay down what each party is expected to do um each part what each party is expected to perform of his obligation and so it is absolutely crucial in any dispute to first establish the terms of the contract before looking to see whether one party has failed to perform his obligation or or not so um <clears throat> when you encounter um this kind of a question in an exam or in this course uh an issue with regard to the terms of the contract you have to uh look at it from three different perspectives number one is is that statement an act is actually a term of a contract or is it merely a representation number two is can any other term be implied by law so if the term is not explicitly mentioned in the contract can that term uh, be implied into and one party says that no this was supposed to be um is um this the other party was supposed to do perform this obligation but it's not written in the contract <clears throat> so can law imply that uh, term into that contract so you have to ask that question and number 3 if a statement is a term of the contract you have to distinguish uh, whether is it whether it is a condition a warranty or an in nominate term um now we are not going to cover this aspect the third aspect today are in um, in our lecture today and we will cover it later on in the future lectures okay all right so now terms and representation in the previous slide i mentioned a it a terminology called representation and i also mentioned terms so we just, we talked a little bit about what terms are and now we are also going to see what representations are so first first of all term or warranties are part of the contract but representations are not part of the contract uh your in your subject guide they have used the word term for warranties but it is essentially the same thing so if you see this word warranty uh, in an exam question it actually means term of a contract okay and uh, representation is a representation that's that's what it is called but the main difference between these two kinds of statements is that the term or a warranty is a part of a contract but the representations are not part of the contract um we all know that terms are um stated terms are stated when when a contract is made so at the time of the contract when the contract is being negotiated and so the terms are laid down but when are representations made representations are also made around about the time of the contract and they can give rise to damages and affect the validity of the contract but they do not actually constitute the term of a contract and you will see that there are very limited situations where representation um give rise to damages and affect the validity of the contract uh but they do not actually constitute the terms of the contract now this distinction between terms and representation is made to decide what remedy is available if a particular statement statement is unfulfilled so if a party did not uh do what the other party thought it was obliged to do then that statement um 
we have to distinguish uh, uh, we have to make a distinction to see whether that statement is a term of a contract or a representation in order to decide the remedy that is available. So if the statement <clears throat> forms the term of the contract, then there is an automatic right to damages for its breach. You have to keep that in mind. But there is no automatic right to damages if the words are just representations. Um, and that, that representation turn out to be untrue, then there is no automatic right to damages. Uh, if the representation is a misrepresentation because it meets such a, such a criteria for such actionability, and we will discuss that later on in our, in our later future lectures, then an action may be brought on the basis of misrepresentation. And we will see in later lectures that a false representation may entitle the innocent party to damages if there is a fault involved. But the usual remedy is to just unravel or undo the contract. And this is known as rescission. Um, and even this remedy can be lost. For example, a third party's right would be affected. If the third party's right is being affected, then this remedy is also lost. Now keep in mind that protection against false representation has, has increased uh, quite a lot during the last third of the 20th century. But the point that you need to keep in mind is that the remedies for breach of a term and those for a false representation are, are different. So you do not need to um, worry too much about misrepresentation or false representation right now because we will cover that in our future lectures. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so when, whenever courts try to distinguish between a term or a false uh, a representation, they need to find the intention of the parties. They need to find whether the parties intended that statement to be a term of a contract or not. So um, usually in, in the University of London exam, this kind of an issue um, comes in, um, in, in connection with other issues. So basically, uh, it is very unlikely that you will see a question, um, a separate question on this issue. It is mostly going to be <clears throat> mixed up with other issues. And uh, you need to keep in mind that while finding the intention of the parties, uh, the test that the courts use is an objective, objective test, as you are aware that in most of the um, we have been discussing this since the beginning of the course, that whenever the court finds the party of the intention of the parties, they look at their objective intentions. <clears throat> Another thing you need to keep in mind is that uh, you cannot make a distinction between a, a term and a, a representation by just looking at the words of that statement. It is absolutely necessary to look at the circumstances. So, um, in Oscar Chess Limited versus Williams, uh, there was a person called Mr. Williams. Uh, he sold a car to the dealers, and the dealers were Oscar Chess. <clears throat> and Mr. Williams said that the car was a 1948 model. Um, and he, he actually had a registration book that stated that the car was 1948 model, and he just relied on that book, uh, registration book, and stated that the car was a 1948 model. But the car was, in fact, a 1939 model. And it was, of course, worth much less. The dealers were, of course, aggrieved when they found out. And they claimed the difference in the value between a 1948 model and a 1939 model as damages for the breach of contract. In this case, Lord Denning explained very clearly the different ways in which the word warranty is used uh, in his judgment. And you are welcome to you uh, to study the judgment of this case. And it is, as usual, um, most of the time, Lord Denning's uh, judgments are very clear and, and they give very clear definitions. Same way, uh, this judgment gives very clear definition of a warranty. Uh, in applying an objective test of inventions, uh, Lord Denning recognized that he must look 
not at the thoughts of the party but at their words and behavior both so not only and not only words but words and behavior both and he thought that it was easier to infer a warranty and warranty here means term of a contract it is easier to infer a warranty when the person making the statement knew or should have known the facts uh, a reasonable a reasonable per person in that situation would infer that such a speaker would intend those words uh, to be part of the contract now this is because a warranty as a term of the contract is a promise um it's a promise that the facts that are being stated are true if the facts are not true then the promise has been breached right and this this means the promiser breached his promise uh, and therefore breached his contract so it is therefore more reasonable to interpret a statement of facts as a promise of the truthfulness of those facts when the person making the statement is in a position to know that right so if if the person is um aware it is in a position to know that 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 those are the keywords here in in lord denning's judgment <clears throat> so um in this case in this particular particular case lord denning thought that mr williams was not in a position where he should have known the true facts he just relied on a misleading registration book right so he so the statements was a uh, representation and not a warranty so it was that's what it was that's what was held that it was a uh, representation right mr william was not in a position where he should have known he just relied on the registration book so that was one main point that was driven from this case uh, lord denning went further and also um, discussed and he thought that if the statements were later on written down it is likely that the parties intended that those statements to be the term of the contract if some statements are omitted when the contract was written down then those statements are likely to be intended as representation um and this is very this is common sense actually right so if two parties have uh, have they later later down wrote down this those statements then they most likely intended those to be terms but if they omitted something then those were most likely intended um as representation but please keep in mind this is not an absolute rule and omitted statements can still form warranties or terms if appropriate objective intention is shown and um this this also brings up the discussion of parallel evidence rule and we will discuss that uh, later today <clears throat> all right so as usual i have a contrasting case for you here uh this is a case uh, called bentley production limited versus harold smith now the facts of the case case are that the dealer sold a car to dick bentley production um and the dealer stated that it had done 20000 miles as shown on the odometer the odometer was incorrect so the question question arose was the statement that car had done 20000 miles a warranty or a representation if you just look at the words of the the facts of this case they look quite similar to the one that we just discussed however it was held again lord denning uh, is the one who gave the judgment here um that on these facts um find out the true mileage therefore the term was intended to be a uh, warranty and not a representation uh, they thought that the uh, dealers were in a position where they should have known the true mileage therefore the term was intended to be a warranty and not a representation now compare this case with oscar chess limited versus williams that we just discussed on previous slide so how why is it this what's the difference 
um, Mr. Williams relied on an incorrect registration book, right? And the dealers here in this case, they relied on an incorrect odometer. So what's the difference? Why is this judgment, why the judgment is so different than the one in Oscar Chess Limited? Very good, excellent. Okay, great. So, right, right, absolutely. Um, so, the in Oscar Chess, the roles were reversed, and the sale was to a dealer by Mr. Williams. Not, it was the sale was not by a dealer. Right, so this may explain why the non-expert seller, Mr. William, was not expected to know the age of the age of the car. And here, the Bentley Productions were dealers, car dealers, and they were experts. They should have known, and they were in a position to know. They and they uh, didn't do much effort to find out the true mileage, as Bash stated. Excellent. Okay. So, um, we discussed two ways to find the intention of the parties in Oscar Chess uh, Limited, right? And now we are going to look at other ways of finding intention. Uh, we are not going to spend much time on this, um, so I'm just going to um, go briefly over it. <clears throat> One of the ways is was uh, driven from the case of Rutledge versus McKay. A long interval be between making the statement and finalizing the agreement indicated that the same statement was a representation and not a warranty. So if you and I are um, talking about something and making uh, talking about making a contract and um, I make a statement, right, and then a long interval passes, a long time has passed, between our conversation and between finalizing the agreement, then the statement that I made was a representation and not a warranty. Okay, so keep that keep that in mind if you encounter such an issue in an exam. Um, okay, so second way, another way of finding the intention of the party is the importance of the statement to the buyer. So that rule was driven uh, from the case of Bannerman versus White. So um, in this case, a statement that the half had not been treated with sulfur was intended to be a term of the contract because of the importance to the buyer of having sulfur-free hops. So it was absolutely important for the buyer to have sulfur-free hops. Uh, and you might here, you might like to think about whether it matters that the seller knows or ought to know of the importance of this to the buyer, right? So feel free to discuss that, that whether uh, whether the seller knew that it was important to the buyer or whether he ought to know that it was, that it is important to the buyer. Is everybody able to see me clearly and hear me clearly? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So the uh. So number three. Where the intentions are unclear. Courts will look at what is most suitable remedy and then decide whether the statement is a warranty or a representation. So it seems that where the party's intentions are unclear to the courts, uh, they will look at what is the 
what is a suitable remedy and then they decide whether the statement is a warranty or a representation in order to achieve the most appropriate result uh, and in other words the court uh, thought that the dealer should not have an automatic right to get damages for breach of contract from mr williams in oscar chess but it thought that one dealer should have an automatic right to damages against the other dealer in the bentley case so um this is another way the courts try to find the uh, courts decide whether a term is a whether a statement is a term or a representation if the intentions are not uh, clear to them if they don't find any other way of finding the intention of the party then they look at the most suitable remedy um and then in shevel versus reed the rule was derived that whether the maker of the statement accepted responsibility for the soundness of the statement okay so i'm not going to go into detail of this one and then in esso petroleum if you are very familiar with this case um where one party clearly relied upon the other that's another way to of finding the intention of the party okay so i have a a summary for you of whatever we have discussed so on your left hand side on the diagram uh, you have representations and on the right hand side you have warranties so representations are not terms of the contract whereas warranties are the terms of the contract and then look right below representation representations have no automatic right to damages and primary remedy is rescission if it's a false statement but this may sometimes be barred if, for example a third party right is involved and whereas in warranties or terms of the contract there is an automatic right to damages if the warranty on that term is broken or not fulfilled so when you distinguish a representation from a warranty there are two approaches to it so first approach is to look at the party's objective intention should the speaker have known the uh, known of the truth of the statement and the case your authority is oscar chess and dick bentley was the statement later written down again lord denning Uh, said this said this in obiter in oscar chess and then how long uh, how long uh, how long was the time period between the making of the statement and the conclusion of the agreement authority is ruthless versus mckay and then how important was the statement to the buyer and then again as i mentioned earlier feel free to discuss whether the seller uh new or ought to know, or ought to know that this was important for the buyer and then the second approach if the intentions are unclear then ask what is the appropriate remedy and uh, so um if the damages are more appropriate in that in a particular case to enforce the bargain then find a warranty so if the rescission is more appropriate rescission means undoing the bargain then find a representation and i will send you this uh, summary later on after after a lecture i will send you this diagram for reference uh kita is asking chapter 7 of which text this is actually i took this diagram from a book uh it is called uh, contract law direction series it's pretty detailed let me write it down for you here contract law direction series and it is by a uh, taylor taylor and taylor so um this book is uh, this this is a very detailed book so um but i do encourage you to if you can um 
buy this book please please go ahead and buy this uh, it is good for confusing concepts actually particularly if something is uh, you know if you find something very confusing you can find that section or that topic in this book and that it explains it very clearly okay all right okay so now let's do, let's discuss parole parole evidence rule now please uh, know that this is not parole with an e okay uh, parole with an e is a conditional release of a person you know that convicted of a crime prior uh, to the expiration of that person's term of Im imprisonment uh, so do not confuse this parole with the parole with with an e this parole means oral and it has nothing to do with parole just on the side note now the purpose of this rule is to um, promote certainty promote certainty of a contract so the general rule was derived from the case of jacob versus patapia and general plantation trust uh and the rule is if the parties have chosen to place their contract in a written document they cannot provide extrinsic evidence to add to vary or contradict the written document the document is the sole source of the terms of the contract that is your general rule here okay and um so the parties cannot introduce any extrinsic evidence what is an extrinsic evidence what do you think is an extrinsic evidence how would you define it outside of the contract terms evidence uh, from outside the written contract very good something outside the document excellent jennifer carl and jeremy very good parties cannot introduce uh, anything that outside of that contract later on if uh, the the written contract is the sole uh, is the whole contract and is the sole source of the terms of the contract so um now where the written document was not intended to cover uh the whole of the agreement the rule does not apply and that rule was derived from allen um allen versus pink now these are the situations where it is admissible where the so where the um written document was not intended if the, it was not the party's intention that this document is going to be the sole source of the terms of the contract then it does not apply and parole evidence is admissible to prove terms or custom which must be implied into the agreement that's another situation where um uh, this rule can be um avoided and this rule and this is it can be admissible to show a misrepresentation mistake fraud or non ex factum um does anyone know what, what is non ex factum um uh, something that is not in fact not your fault not your deed it is a specific it's a non factual okay hmm jennifer jennifer is saying defense could be used this defense could be used let's say by blind person not able to read the document who was misled to content of the document before signing it and it is not and that's absolutely correct jennifer and it is not limited to uh blind people it can be anyone who was misled into signing the document if someone signs a document uh by mistake but not negligently so this doctrine applies there and a successful plea would make the contract void it makes if the this plea non ex factum plea is successful it makes the 
contract void. Um, and basically, this, this is a doctrine that allows the signing party to escape the performance of the agreement. So in these situations, to show a misrepresentation, mistake, fraud, or non aspectum, uh, this can be admissible. And then to show that a contract has not yet come into operation or has ceased to operate. Again, you can bring in extrinsic evidence. Uh, parallel evidence may be admitted to prove the existence of a collateral contract. Collateral, what is a collateral contract? So this parallel evidence may be admitted to prove that there is a collateral contract, a separate contract, additional agreement on the side, yes, affecting another contract, that affects the other contract. Absolutely right, excellent. So um, that brings us to the discussion of terms of a collateral contract, <clears throat> which are sometimes called collateral warranties. So these are basic, essentially the same thing, terms of a collateral contract or collateral warranties. They are the same thing. And the purpose, um, a lot of uh, the writers, a lot of the um, scholars think that the purpose of this rule, this contract, collateral contract or collateral warranties is to, uh, is a way to get around parallel evidence rule that the oral statements cannot be warranties. Okay, so this was, um, this rule was derived from uh, the case, the Lassell, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it, versus Gilford. Um, so the facts of the case are that the landlord, there was a landlord stated that the brains of the property worked. And um, this, of course, was not, a, not the part of a written lease. Usually it's not, right? And it was held that the statement was a collateral warranty to the written lease. Now, because the lease was uh, in writing and supposed to constitute the whole contract, the court used the idea of a collateral warranty to give a remedy in damages for breach of the collateral warranty without interfering the main written contract, okay? Now, this is um, the book that I just mentioned, Concept or Direction Series. The authors in that book say that this, this, uh, this rule or this collateral, this concept, it's, it's a cheat. And because they, the courts are basically trying to find a way to give damages to uh, the aggrieved party. And you should not be afraid to say so in an exam. Um, so in effect, the courts are basically saying that we can't allow the statement to form a term of the contract, but, but let's make up another uh, contract, a collateral contract, so it can be a term of that contract, and then the problem is solved. So, um, and this is the view of uh, a lot of writers, and you, you are welcome to discuss that in your exam. So, let's discuss this case, Shanklin Pier. Limited versus detailed product. This, uh, this route was used to evade privity rules. So let's look at that a case in detail, and I have the a diagram for. So the Shanklin Pier owners um, employed a form of decorators to paint their pier. What is a what is a pier? It's for those who don't know. It's a it's a kind of a structure that leads from the from the shore to the to the body of the water, and Shanklin specified uh, details paint to the painters or decorators. Okay, so the decorators contracted to buy paint from Detail. So Detail was a manufacturer of paint, and that was the main contract under question paint between the painters and Detail the contract number two that you see in the diagram. Now the pier owners had previously, they had previously asked Detail whether the paint was suitable for piers. And of course, if 
if a paint is suitable for peers, waterproofing is an obvious is obviously a must. And Detail stated that it was uh, suitable for peers. Now, Detail's statement obviously could not form a warranty under the main contract between the painter and Detail. The contract on the right hand side that you see, contract number two. So it could not form a warranty under that contract. Um, but the peer owners were not. They were not a party to this main contract, so they could not sue under that contract. However, the court saw that the peer owners deserved a remedy directly against Detail for the consequences of Detail's false statement. So it held that the statement was a collateral warranty in a separate side contract between uh, peer owners and Detail. And on um, on this, the former uh, peers, peer owners, could sue the letter for the breach of warranty. Okay, so this is how the courts give remedy to the peer owners, Shanklin, in this case. So, um, what do you think was the consideration of that collateral contract that the courts thought they exist existed? Detail supplied paint. Business guarantee. Right. Right, because the Shanklin had specified detail paint to the decorators. So that was thought to be the consideration. So in Sandeep's words, a guarantee of the business, business guarantee that they will give business to detail. That was considered a consideration in this case. Excellent. Yes, Bash, buying paint from detail. Very good. That was the consideration considered a consideration in this collateral contract. <clears throat> okay, so let's now discuss the implied terms. And um, in the beginning of this lecture, um, I mentioned that whenever you encounter this issue, you have to, it's either distinguishing between um, representational terms or uh, the issue is surrounding whether a term can be implied in the contract. So from your um, understanding as law students, which statement do you think is true? A or B, and I need a, a reason as well. So I need a volunteer who can unmute himself or herself and give and tell us which one is a true statement and why. Who's our volunteer? Okay. All right. So, um, Jennifer and Dash have given us the answer, and a lot of you um, gave us the answer, that B is a correct statement, that courts are generally reluctant to imply the terms of a contract. And why? That courts generally consider their role to be as the interpreter of the contract and not the maker of the contract. And the more frequently terms are implied into a contract, the greater extent to which the courts have created the contract rather than merely interpreted it. So that's the reason why the, why the courts are reluctant to imply terms of a contract. Um, so my question number two, do courts need to imply terms in some situations and why?
some in some situations do they need to imply the terms and why do they need to do so if, if they need to do so yes in some situations jeremy is saying that in some situations the contract is incomplete so to make the contract effective Okay. Good, good. Right. So the purpose of implied terms is is most of the times to supplement a contractual agreement in the interest of making the deal effective as Jeremy said for the purposes of could be for business or to achieve fairness between the parties or maybe to relieve hardship on the parties. So in some situations courts do imply terms okay so the courts will imply terms into contracts either by operation of common law or by statute law and let's look at these two different categories so we are just going to look briefly at statutory implied terms and most commonly uh, used examples are section uh, sections 12 to 15 of sales of goods act 1979 um and the most relevant section is section 14 of the sales of goods act 1979 as amended by the sale and supply of goods act 1994 and it says that that goods sold by a seller in the course of his business shall be of satisfactory quality okay so this is uh, you are if the issue with regard to statutory implied terms appear in an exam this is the most relevant section section 14 uh, which says that goods sold by a seller in the course of his business shall be of satisfactory quality um and the purpose of this of these statutes uh, is to provide a sanitization of terms in certain kinds of contract and it also provides a measure of protection for certain categories of parties such as consumers so detailed knowledge of these sections is not required uh but you should keep in mind that the fact that the fact that these terms are only implied uh by the statute law uh, and it is it is open to the parties to defeat uh this implication either it is can be uh, defeated by the by the parties contracting parties either by the course of dealing or by their express agreement so although there are these statutory implied terms and these terms must be implied there are situations where parties can avoid it uh but do keep in mind that only uh, in very limited situations can the parties do that um mostly only business contracts as opposed to the consumer are allowed to agree to modify these implied terms and then only if the court thinks that it is reasonable so this this happens only most most of the time in a commercial contract and not a consumer contract and uh, remember that the object of the implied term here this uh, spe specifically these sections that we just discussed is not to make the agreement work but to protect the purchaser and in particular consumer purchases so remember that the statutory implied terms go further than the common law um than the common law uh, implied terms okay so in the usually common law implied terms are um there to make the contract work but the statutory implied terms go beyond it and the purpose of these terms is also to protect the consumers and to protect the weaker party all right now let's look at implied terms in common law so first one is trade usage where there is an established trade usage where where the trade use established trade usage can be established such as in commercial contracts then the common law implies uh has given us this rule that terms can be implied into a contract and example uh that i took from your subject guide 
of such a situation is that a vendor of a certain type of good, let's suppose, uh, always paid the broker's commission with regard to the sale, absent a term to the contrary, then courts will imply such a term into this type of a contract. Okay, so the other situation where uh, terms can be implied uh, depends on the nature of the relationship such as landlord tenant or employer and employee. So the two main cases that you have is um, uh, Malik versus BCCI and Liverpool. In Malik versus BCCI, the bank had operated corruptly and it was held that there was an implied obligation upon an, um, upon an employer not to conduct his business in a manner likely to destroy or seriously damage the relationship of confidence and trust between employer and employee. So this was implied into the contract. All right. So the next one is the unexpressed intention of the parties. This is called Moorcock test sometimes. Uh, the courts may imply terms into the contract to give effect to what appears to be the unexpressed intention of the parties. And the key point here is that without such a term, the contract uh, was effectively unworkable. And then um, the last situation is of, a, uh, of where there is an officious bystander. So you have to think that, or the courts think that, what if an imaginary officious bystander had suggested the term uh, that statement under question at the making of a contract. So um, we are going to discuss this in a little bit more detail in the next slides. Let's look at the Moorcock test first. So um, the facts of this case, the facts of Moorcock case is the claimant moored his ship at the defendant's wharf on the river Thames. And now what is to moor a ship? To moor, to moor a ship is to um, secure the ship with cables. So the claimant moored his ship at the defendant's wharf on the River Thames. The River Thames, uh, everybody knows that it's a tidal river. Now we know um, because of this case. The ship became damaged due to uneven surfaces and rocks on the riverbed. Then, therefore, the claimant sought to claim damages from the defendant, and the defendant argued that there was no provision in the contract warranting the condition of the riverbed. So there was nothing said in the contract that about the condition of the riverbed. And it was held that the court implied a term, in fact, that the riverbed would be safe for mooring. The court introduces business efficacy test. That is, the term must be necessary to give contract business effect. And this type of implication is also called implication in fact. So um, uh, judges made it clear that the implication was found on the presumed intention of the party that it was necessary to give business efficacy to the transaction. Uh, the business of the wharf owner could not be carried on if incoming ships did not believe that the wharf was not safe or did not was not safe for their ships, right? And um, the owners were the only party who could know whether the wharf was safe, and so it was necessary to imply an obligation to take care that it was safe. So to give so business efficacy rule was derived from this test. Okay, so sometimes this, uh, this whole uh, topic of implied terms comes as an essay question as well. And um, I will give you a question that talks about, uh, that calls for a discussion on Moorcock test and a comparison between uh, different situations where the terms are implied. So I will send that to you in an email. So uh, we just looked at 
um, the business efficacy test that the term must be necessary to give contract business effect. And in later cases, courts looked for other ways of determining the intention of the parties. Um, and the officious bystander test came into being. Okay. So basically, what is an officious bystander test? Imagine that um, what ha would have happened if an imaginary officious bystander was standing there when the contract was being made and he had suggested the term under question. And the reply of the parties was, oh, of course, of course. So the term was so obvious that it goes, that it goes without saying. Then the court would imply the term, that term. And this uh, rule was derived from Shear Law versus Southern Foundries. Right. So basically, the courts um, again, just to uh, reinforce, the courts generally would not imply a term simply because it appears reasonable. This means that if the term that the officials bystander has suggested um, that was in question was so obvious that the answer of the parties would have been, oh, of course, of course, yeah, that is well. So it was so obvious, then they would imply that term into the contract. Okay. All right. So, um, in your subject guide, there um, there was some more to this topic, and which related to conditions, warranties, and in nominate terms, and distinguishing between them. Uh, we are going to discuss these topics in connection with performance and breach. Uh, in our future lectures because those are uh, more connected to performance and breach and it will make more sense once we uh, once we do performance and breach. So uh, I will discuss that uh, in detail with you, the distinction between conditions, warranties and in nominate terms when we discuss performance and breach. And I am going to end my lecture here.